you think of the example of Facebook, when Facebook was invented, this great idea, we're going to be able to have social networks around the world. We can all follow each other's lives. It's all going to be lovely and, and warm and fluffy. And I'm sure that no one who was investing in Facebook kind of thought, or it could be used to fuel genocide in Myanmar. You know, so you actually need to be talking to human rights people at the start to kind of say, well, what's the worst that could happen? Well, you know, genocide is a, the worst that could happen. And so if that is the risk with what you're creating, then you want to be thinking right from the start about how you mitigate and prevent that. Susie, thanks so much for joining us on the Dark Mode podcast. It's a pleasure to have you. My pleasure. I would actually like to kick off this episode by actually introducing you. So for the audience listening for this episode, Susie Allegre is an international human rights lawyer, author of Freedom to Think, and keynote speaker. The most fascinating part of Susie's thought leadership is her expertise around the impact of technology and AI on the rights to freedom of thought and opinion, particularly given the rise of high tech and the acceleration of a hyper-connected world. How'd I go there, Susie? Not bad. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So out of all the things that you've been doing in your life, Susie, and like what an amazing background that you have. And I think what you're bringing to the fold now in terms of the ethical conversation around technology is completely unmatched. And I'm a massive fan of that, having been anchored by a lot of humanitarian thinking. And so to kick off the episode, I actually want to ask you. What actually, what was it that inspired you to put your energy and focus into freedom to think in the digital realm? I suppose, as you say, I've got a fairly varied background in, in law and human rights, sort of going from being a practitioner to working for international organizations, for NGOs, and through various sectors, including sort of anti-corruption, uh, counter-terrorism, uh, human rights at borders. Uh, and so I'd come across um, the way technology affects our human rights in various different ways, particularly from the privacy perspective and looked at sort of how we protect privacy while countering terrorism and, and that sort of traditional area, if you like, I mean, particularly um, the right to private life um, when you're talking about, about technology and data protection. But my real kind of wake up moment was the first time I read about Cambridge Analytica and this idea of behavioral microtargeting in elections. And I remember it very clearly because it was in early 2017. So it was the year after the Brexit referendum, which, you know, I'm in the UK um, and a Europe expert. And so it was quite a profound, you know, existential shift in my life. And so suddenly reading this article which was talking about the Brexit referendum and Trump and explaining how Cambridge Analytica had used people's data uh, collected online from their social media online activities to categorize and profile people and to understand what makes them tick and to use those same platforms to then manipulate them in order to affect the referendum or the elections was something so shocking. And I suppose it's something that I'd probably read about elsewhere, but it just hadn't really hit home. And it was that moment of thinking, wow, you know, is that why I didn't get up and, and campaign around the referendum? You know, I was very late to the party of being concerned about what the, what the outcome might be. Um, and so suddenly I was sitting there and I, then I was reading around, you know, concerns about data protection, concerns about, um, election funding, concerns about privacy. And I thought, no, this isn't about privacy. This is about manipulating how people think and how they behave ultimately. You know, this is about the right to freedom of thought. And then I started to look into it partly because I was looking at, you know, all their avenues for legal challenge uh, to address this and found that there was almost nothing written about the right to freedom of thought, not just in, in the tech space, but in general, it was sort of very much a forgotten right. I found one article about freedom of thought in neuroscience um, written by a German academic, uh, Christoph Bublitz, which, you know, was looking at a very direct question about, you know, interference with our brain, but this wider space of freedom of thought and the way we all engage on a daily basis with technology, I couldn't find anything there. And that sort of set me off on a 
kind of one woman campaign uh, to shift this narrative because I thought, you know, well, I've been working on privacy for years and years and years and written reams of policy briefings and, you know, reports. It never really felt personal, you know, bizarrely, you know, obviously privacy is about your personal life and your private life, but it never felt so uh, viscerally personal. But when I started thinking about it as the right to freedom of thought, it just felt, it felt really personally disturbing and, and like a personal violation uh, of my rights. Absolutely. Susie, before we go through all the technology rabbit holes here, could you frame up the absolute rights as it pertains to human rights, just to give that context for the audience? Yeah. So the right to freedom of thought um, and the related right to freedom of opinion, they come alongside other rights that you might have heard of more frequently. So right to freedom of religion and belief, right to freedom of expression. Um, and so we find the right to freedom of thought, in particular in international human rights law, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and other regional um, treaties, we find the right to freedom of thought generally alongside the right to freedom of religion and belief and, and freedom of conscience as well. Generally, it's been looked at from that perspective of, of religion, sometimes conscience as well, particularly in um, the sort of context of conscientious objectors in the military. And then we see the right to freedom of opinion come alongside um, the right to freedom of expression. And so when you think about opinion and expression, you can see these kind of two sides to the right, which works in the same way with the right to freedom of thought, which is you have an external right. You have the right to express your thoughts and opinions, to share them with the world. And you have the internal right. You have the right to believe whatever you want inside your head. But international human rights law deals with those two aspects quite differently. So when you say something or when you manifest your religion or belief in human rights law, those rights can be limited. So you can say whatever you like, but you have to take the consequences. So you can't use your rights to freedom of expression to destroy other people's rights, for example, or to stir up, to stir up hatred um, or to destroy other people's right to private life. So once you get into the external aspects of the right, there are ways that, that it can be limited by law. But that internal aspect, that right to think what you want inside your head, to form your own opinions and to change your own opinions is what's called an absolute right. And so it means that in international law, there can never ever be a justification for interfering with that absolute right inside your head. And if you think about other absolute rights, um, most rights are limited, but other absolute rights include the right um, to freedom from torture and the right to freedom from slavery. And if you take, think of those sort of three together, you can see that they're really about the, you know, the essentials of what it means to be human, if you like. Um, and so it really stresses the importance of this absolute right um, to human dignity. You know, having said that, obviously we're all influenced and we don't really think freely if we're not able to get information, if we're not able to talk to each other, if we're not able to influence each other. So it's not about a, a right to be free from influence, um, but it is a kind of question of, well, what, what does that freedom mean? And there are three aspects to that inner freedom that we can see in international human rights law, which make it real, if you like, that make it a real and effective right. The first part of that is the right um, not to reveal your thoughts. Uh, and that's incredibly important. And it connects really in a way to the right to private life. We can see there that private life is a gateway right, if you like, to that inner freedom, inner privacy, um, and the right not to, to give away what we're thinking. And that's incredibly important because, you know, we all have thoughts that maybe aren't safe in certain spaces. You know, we need to decide when and how we want to express ourselves um, to be sure that, that we are you know, expressing ourselves in a way that is, that is safe for us um, and for other people, potentially. The second part is the right not to be manipulated, right, not to have your thoughts manipulated. And that, again, it's a question of where does... Um, manipulation, where does influence tip over into manipulation? That's kind of question of where is that line? Um, and the third part is the right not to be penalized for your thoughts alone. 
So as I said earlier, once you express your thoughts, once you say something or act on it, then you take the consequences uh, of your expression. But you have a right not to be criminalized or not to be penalized just because of what's going on inside your head. And crucially, not just because of inferences about what's going on inside your head. So it doesn't really matter whether the inferences are correct. Um, you can't just be, um, be punished for what someone thinks is going on inside your head. So one part, it has been a tectonic shift really because of the behavioral micro, micro targeting coming out of big tech companies, for example, Brexit and Trump and these big geopolitical really shock waves that have occurred historically. And then the second part is really around the psychometric and behavioral profiling and the, the all parts leading to inferences when even things like AI are being developed with biases and there's a whole ethical debate that underpins that, which is why this conversation is so important to be talking about at the moment, Susie. Is that a good summary? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And that's the thing that when I, while I started out, you know, with, with shock at Cambridge Analytica, when I started to look at the issues, I realized that it, it's a general trend of technology, that most of the tech that we walk around with in our pockets and the kind of, you know, very futuristic, if you say, you know, imagination of tech is about getting inside our heads. Um, and, and that's why I sort of felt that this right to freedom of thought is a really crucial framework for technologists um, and for the public and for policymakers to think about, well, actually, where does this take us? And, and is this what we want? Um, and it goes, yeah, as you say, it's, you know, from politics through the military to dating apps and shopping. It's kind of, it's everywhere. Susie, we're in the age of the influencers. Uh, and I want to ask your opinion on where that boundary exists between influence and manipulation. Is there a boundary or is it case by case, you know, keen on your thoughts, if there is a boundary and what that looks like? Well, a bit of both. Um, I'm sorry, I'm a lawyer, so you're probably going to get quite a lot of a bit of both, you know, on the one hand and on the other hand. Um, so there is a boundary where it is, we don't yet quite know. Um, and I think one of the things that I would like to see is courts and policymakers starting to grasp the nettle and looking at specific case uses and saying, okay, this, this is the wrong side uh, of that line. The European Court of Human Rights looked at that boundary in the context of religion um, and said, you know, there is a difference between preaching and brainwashing. Uh, and, you know, if you think about it in those terms, I think that's quite a useful prism. I mean, having said that, they still haven't, you know, set down a, a clear test of where you decide where that line is. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things I talked about in the book was, you know, the idea of creepy lines, you know, Google's famous uh, uh, statement about, um, you know, that our job is to go right up to the creepy line and not cross it. Um, and I would say that, you know, if it's starting to feel creepy, it's probably the wrong side of that line uh, to manipulation. Um, the other thing is that I don't think you don't necessarily need to have the right to freedom of thought sort of stamped on the label to see where those lines are. And one example um, that I looked at was subliminal advertising. So when subliminal advertising was first posited as, as a great idea, um, you know, this idea that you can flash advertising images at people when they're in the cinema so quickly that they can't even see it. Uh, but at, at the break time, they'll go out and, and buy your brand of cola uh, without realizing why. You know, it was put forward as this great revolution in advertising and solves so many problems because who wants to sit through adverts in cinema, but you know, you can do it painlessly without even realizing that you're being advertised to. Um, and while it's still not even proved whether subliminal advertising works, it is banned in Europe. So, you know, it's something that was banned without having to show that it actually works because the idea of it is clearly so dangerous and, and open to being hijacked that you can't do it. When we look at this sort of surveillance-based advertising that we are all experiencing all the time in our online interactions, 
and even beyond that. You know, I think that's really very similar to subliminal advertising because it's about personal targeted manipulation. You know, advertising, of course, is about influence. You know, that's, that's what it's there for. That's what they're paid for. But this very personalized kind of targeting, I think, steps over the wrong side of, of that manipulation line because it is using your foibles, you know, your characteristics, your weaknesses, identifying in real time you know, when you're most likely to be susceptible to being manipulated, if you like, and then hitting you with it. So I would say that generally this surveillance based advertising, targeted advertising, which is based on, you know, our inferences about our personalities or our moods rather than advertising that's contextual, if you like. So based on, I'm going to advertise a tent to you because you're on a camping website. Um, I think that steps over the wrong side of that manipulation line. But we, I think we will see that line becoming clearer through cases coming to court and through discussions as well in parliaments um, around the world. And certainly the discussions are happening. They really, you know, they're really starting to happen uh, now in a way that they weren't five years ago. The creepy line, that was Tim Cook, wasn't it, in a commencement speech? Is that right, Susie? No, it wasn't. It was, it's a Google quote. I can't remember who from Google. Google yeah, the creepy line for the, the uh, Tim, quote. Tim Cook was the, the freedom to be human. Freedom to be human. There you go. Yeah. I, I feel like what your last point just then, Susie, about this conversation is coming to fruition more and more in the courts and society as well. But I think people are starting to realize and through books like Freedom to Think, through Thought Leadership, through us having conversation and the fact that we're still learning about it and, and figuring it out, but it does need to be governed and protected is really important because I believe everybody is now waking up to the fact that this does actually happen through technology. So it's safeguarding ourselves in an online community. Absolutely. And when you, when you start to look at, you know, how new technology is being developed, how the ideas are being sold, you know, it's not covered up. A lot of it is about getting inside the head, you know, nudge technology. It's about, you know, how can we change the way people think and feel? And, you know, that's what it's designed for, you know, as we see, you know, health trackers are increasingly becoming nude trackers, you know, they, you know, it is what it says on the tin. And I think that's an important um, thing to consider is that if what it says on the tin would be a violation of human rights, you don't need to prove that they're doing it correctly before you decide to regulate it or ban it. Yeah, for sure. The, the other thing you speak about as well, Susie, is AI. What, what does the ethical conundrum behind the advancement of AI mean to you? Again, it probably depends in terms of um, case by case, but I suppose the idea that AI can be used to understand and manipulate us is the sort of the fundamental question. And you talked earlier about concerns about bias in data sets. And I've seen a lot of the discussions around that kind of question of, you know, how can we de-bias the data sets? How can we make um, the tech field and tech innovation more diverse so that it, you know, reflects the dangers? But for me, there's a really more fundamental question, which goes back to that fundamental, you know, absolute right to freedom of thought. If what you're trying to do is to get inside people's heads and move around the furniture, then you shouldn't be allowed to do that regardless of the question of bias. You know, the bias and discrimination is about the follow on impact. It, it exacerbates the problem. But in my view, we need to kind of get back to basics and think about, you know, if what you're trying to do would itself be a violation of an absolute right then you can't do it regardless of the data um, that you're using. And if we go back to that first principle uh, and sort of rethink what it is that tech is trying to do, particularly when you're looking at startups and innovation, it's, you know, when you start thinking, I've got a brilliant idea, you know, think about that idea. How does that affect our right to freedom of thought? Is it about trying to extract from people's heads what they're thinking without them expressing it? Is it about trying to influence people without them noticing 
you know, getting past their um, rational faculties? Is it about categorizing people in ways that are going to penalize some people based on inferences about what's going on um, inside their heads? And if it is, then you can't do it. Uh, it's not about then, you know, making it slightly better. And I think that's why freedom of thought is a very different perspective from privacy. Um, and so we hear a lot of discussions about, you know, privacy protective um, tech. So looking at ways that you can carry on doing this profiling and manipulation, but in a way where we're not going to know what your name is. Um, but you don't need to know someone's name to manipulate them or to use their, their data, um, you know, in ways that, that manipulate them. So I think it's, for me, the ethical question is a much more fundamental one. And it's one that then raises the whole question of our future relationship with technology and the direction that we want um, technology uh, to go in. And one of the things I thought was really interesting um, from Tim Cook's uh, Stanford address, um, where he talked about the, the freedom to be human, which I think is essentially this right to freedom of thought, really. But he talked about the way that our sort of daily engagements with technology, the issues around um, addictive technology, around profiling and targeting, how all of that sort of direction of travel would have stopped Silicon Valley in its tracks. So if we'd had all of that, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, there would be no uh, Silicon Valley. We wouldn't have the tech innovation that we have today. And so from a technology perspective, I think it's really important to think about this idea of the right to freedom of thought and how fundamentally important it is, not just, you know, for the general public or for, you know, being nice to people or humanitarian reasons, but also actually to protect the future of tech innovation itself. You know, what does our future look like if we lose this right to freedom of thought? There's seven rabbit holes I want to go down after that, <laughs> but I'll pick one. Um, it comes back to me, it comes back to, to something I've heard you talk about is, uh, is the right to opt in. So where does that right sit in relation to human rights for us to opt in as the product of things like surveillance based marketing or, you know, us being not the consumer of tech. Now we are actually the product of technology for further onset. Is, is there a human right involved in opting in? Is this a question there? Yeah, I think the question of opting in goes to the question of consent and informed consent. And so I suppose if you go back to what I said earlier about the difference between influence and manipulation, um, you know, we choose what we want to read in principle, you know, we choose who we want to talk to, who we want to listen to. Um, and I suppose the, there's been a, quite a lot of discussion in the kind of digital rights space about the right to switch off, you know, just the right to not have this stuff um coming at you and it's something that i um talked about as well in the book around online pornography and that one of the big problems about online pornography is its ubiquity and the difficulty to actually you know make it not appear in your home potentially you know the fact that you have to go through all these hoops to kind of keep it away from from your children um, and so that idea of opting out is important to consent and about that, that human agency, if you like. And so I talked about opting out, I mean, opting in, sorry, um, on personalization uh, of content. And so how we form our opinions, how we change our opinions has a lot to do with the content, um, that we see. And you talk about, you know, rabbit holes and that, that kind of classic question of, of how people get taken down personalized rabbit holes. One of the, the fascinating pieces of research I came across when I was researching for the book was um, American researchers who went to a flat earth conference to find out how the people there had got to the position where they believed that the earth is flat. Um, and everyone there, bar one, had come to the conclusion that the earth was flat through YouTube. They'd started with different conspiracy theories. They hadn't gone try to find out if the earth was flat. They'd gone there, you know, whether it was sort of 9-11 conspiracies or, you know, whatever it was, but they'd then been taken down a rabbit hole to the point where they were prepared to pay money to fly across the country, to hang out with other people at a conference, to share their beliefs 
um, that the earth is flat. And that is just incredibly powerful. It really shows the, the power of these um, personalized um, curation of information, if you like this, this idea that, you know, it's being picked up that you're someone who's susceptible to conspiracy theories. So, you know, here, have another one. And so one of the things that I suggested from a policy perspective is that actually making it obligatory to opt in to personalized curation of your feeds makes you think about it. It gives you the opportunity to go looking for things or to just say, okay, today, you know, I want to just sit back and be told uh, what it is I might like, but effectively, you know, personalized delivery of information tells us what the AI thinks we want to know, what the AI thinks people like us should want to know or should be looking at. And it completely takes away our ability to, to open our minds, um, to have random chance encounters with information and people and, and content that might help us shift our worldview. And one of the really important things about freedom of thought is that ability to change your mind. You know, whatever you may be thinking now, you may have a completely different perspective tomorrow or in 10 years time. And that's really key to, you know, to our development as humans. I was going to say that there's, there's 14 spheres of influence as one of our previous guests talked about, um, in 2022, uh, whereas 70 years ago, there was only four or five, uh, mm -hmm. and we're now in the information age where our belief systems have radically changed with the, the adoption of, you know, these additional triple metrics in terms of the, the influence, uh, spheres. Uh, and I don't think we as a civilization were ready for the amount of information to be presented to us. And with the addition of AI that was based on those initial and early tough test subjects, especially with machine learning fed into that yeah. algorithm, yeah, we, we, we've fundamentally not been prepared for the, the curated approach to our, our mainstream media. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's interesting. And I'm. I don't know very much about the, the background or the, or how it's going. Um, but I found it fascinating that earlier this year, China brought in a law banning recommender algorithms. I don't know how it's, how it's working or where it came from, but this kind of question of recommender algorithms, I think is going to be really at the, the front line of regulation, um, going forward and, and, you know, looking at what recommender algorithms mean for, for our societies. Susie, do you think that there's, like, when I think about humanity and just the fact that there's so many unknowns and things we're still figuring out about who we are and even the whole neuroscience behind, you know, the frontiers of new science and developments coming out of neuroscience and let's go straight to neurotechnology. It's like, surely that's fraught with danger around, you know, the techno technological interface in terms of where our minds are developing to because of these sort of things? Absolutely. Uh, you know, neuroscience is, if you like, the pointy end of the threat to our right to freedom of thought. You know, while social media is kind of affecting all of us all the time, but, you know, this idea that we might be able to create technology where, you know, we can read straight out of people's brains uh, what they're thinking, who they are, you know, what they're, what they're like is really um, disturbing in, in so many ways. And one of the things that I looked at in the book was, was um, neuropolitics. And, you know, the, the micro-targeting is in a way a part um, of that or sort of behavioral neuroscience. Um, but there is research that seems to show that, um, you know, brain scans can show which side of the political divide you're going to be. Um, and you know, how you respond to questions that are not political can reveal your political beliefs. So putting in place regulation, you know, immediately to prohibit that in democracies is absolutely crucial if we want a democratic future, um, because that's something then, you know, your brain print dictates whether or not you get led into the voting booth <laughs> essentially. And it could be a brain print that was taken for a completely other reason. You know, the thing, the really disturbing thing about that research was that it came from previous research that had been looking at gambling. I think it was people's responses to gambling and risk. 
uh, and that that was then overlaid with research about what that said about people's political opinions. So on the political front, I think it's very disturbing. But then we look as well at things like, um, you know, Neuralink, um, the brain computer interfaces being developed. Often we'll see that arguments around neuroscience are about medicine. So it's about, you know, going to help people, you know, we're going to unlock people with locked in syndrome. But if these developments and these investigations really are about medicine, why are we not saying up front that they can never be used as consumer technology? Uh, because, you know, what do you do if you go and get your brain computer interface that you can't remove, uh, that will allow, you know, two way traffic of somebody else to interfere with and extract your thoughts? I mean, the idea is, you know, it's science fiction, but it's being, it's in development now. Uh, and apparently, you know, we don't have the law and regulation on the ground to stop that happening, you know, as a reality, you know, moving on from our phones, it's almost like, you know, we've been softened up with the phones and the next thing is, you know, well, how easy is this? It's, it's super easy. You just go into the shop, get your brain computer interface, uh, plugged in and you never have to think about anything for yourself again. Um, and so I, I, I think we really, really need to urgently, um, look at these questions and the right to freedom of thought for me is the crucial perspective and it puts an obligation on governments to protect our right to freedom of thought. So it's not just about, you know, stopping the government getting inside our heads. It's about making sure that governments take steps, um, to address very real threats. You know, one of my favorite cases from the European Court of Human Rights was a case against Romania, where a woman was attacked by a pack of wild dogs in Bucharest. Um, and the case was brought that the Romanian state had failed to protect her physical integrity and her right to private and family life. And the case was upheld. It was found that yes, this was a violation of her rights, uh, because the authorities knew about the danger of wild dogs and failed to take any action. Uh, to stop it and protect her. And I think that's an incredibly useful analogy when you think about, you know, the, the wild dogs of big tech, you know, trying to get inside our heads. It's like, a, you know, it's up there. It's, it's in your PowerPoint presentations. It's, you know, it's all over the media. We all know it's happening. Why are governments not taking, you know, radical action to actually just say, sorry, this is, this is never going to happen. And if you want to develop it for medical purposes, well, maybe, uh, but that's all it's ever going to be. And so, you know, making it very clear again, this sort of question of using regulation to steer the path of innovation, uh, and to create the societies that we want for the future. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to go straight to the innovation pathway, Susie, because you do mention oftentimes about regulating and enforcing, particularly anchored in the human rights and digital rights in now in this context, but with the regulation will steer innovation to a new frontier of where technological development will come. But for me, a lot of this conversation comes down to being anchored in good ethics and having that law and regulation shaping the future of tech and advancement and where humanity is going now. So like, what do you think it's going to take? I mean, I know that there's a lot that is occurring and progressing right now, but what will it take for law and regulation to really catch up and, and to stop those slippery slopes. No, I mean, I'm a great believer in, in the power of change and that things do change. You know, it's why I spent 25 years being a human rights lawyer instead of a commercial lawyer, I guess, you know, that I, I, I have been an activist and, and have seen how things, um, things do shift. It's always incremental. You know, if you, if you work in, in human rights in particular, you know, things change often slowly, but sometimes you can sort of suddenly see, um, an avalanche and in this space, particularly around tech, we often hear talk about the European union, for example, being at the forefront of regulation on you know, privacy, um, and, and data protection and a lot of weight goes on looking at the EU, which has been grappling with these issues, but sometimes, you know, you'll find big shifts come, uh, in small places. Uh, and one of my, you know, favorite things about where I come from, which is a tiny Island in the British Isles, the Isle of Man, 
which despite New Zealand's claim to fame, the Isle of Man actually, you know, gave women the vote in national elections, I think about a decade before New Zealand did. Um, and it brought in, you know, votes for women, very nearly brought in universal suffrage if it hadn't been for the British government getting very twitchy about having that on their doorstep. Um, and it happened because a suffragette went on a speaking tour over the summer to the Isle of Man um, and the following January, it was in law. Uh, and so I have this kind of great belief that actually sometimes big changes can happen more quickly and more effectively in small places. And that if you get a change in a small country, um, it can then have a ripple effect around the world so that something then becomes just so obvious um, in a way that while it's being debated in, you know, larger jurisdictions with more complex um, political interests and heavier lobbying, um, you know, these things can seem impossible and, and immovable. Um, so I have a great belief that maybe, you know, the next shift will come from somewhere smaller um, rather than necessarily, you know, the EU and the US, which is where people are always looking. And, and so we've seen, for example, in Chile, Chile has brought in new uh, laws last year about um, protecting neuro rights. So Chile is kind of at the forefront of looking at these questions of neuroscience and how the law needs to protect us from the future of neuroscience or to guide the future uh, of neuroscience. And I think we will see, you know, pop up developments, if you like, that around the world um, where, where we'll get an idea of, of what that future is. Things like, you know, banning surveillance advertising. Again, it's something that, that when I first started looking at these issues, it was complete pie in the sky. You know, there's no way everybody just said, no, it's, it's too big. You know, the, the industry is too big to fail. It's not going to happen. The lobby is massive. And then suddenly we saw it, you know, in the EU's Digital Services Act, starting to actually shift the dial, particularly on targeted advertising to children. And even, you know, in President Biden's State of the Union speech, we saw him talking about stopping targeted advertising to children. Once you've stopped targeted advertising to children, you know, you then have to question, well, if it's so bad, why are we letting their parents be, be targeted? Why, are, why do any of us want it if we don't want it for our, for our children? And so I, I think there is change happening and it could come from anywhere. Um, but there are all these sort of key planks of the drivers, if you like, of the current direction. Uh, and I think surveillance advertising is one of them, which also then connects into this sort of question of recommender algorithms as well. It's all sort of slightly connected, this surveillance-based model of, of consumer technology and sort of global uh, technology. And if you cut that out, then people have to think of a different way uh, of operating. Yeah, only just last week I saw Ben get an online nudge and buy a set of Nike kicks, Susie. So you're right there. <laughs> I did it again last night and bought two jumps yeah. as well. No, I mean, I'm absolutely not immune to it at all. And, you know, I remember after I had my, my daughter, you know, sitting breastfeeding with your phone at late at night, being sold stuff that you absolutely need uh, as a new mother as, you know, prime, prime example of that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I really like what you say about potentially in smaller pockets, not so much the behemoths, but maybe there'll be some leadership out of smaller by size or population nations. And potentially if New Zealand doesn't take the claim to fame that you spoke about, maybe, maybe Jacinda will, you know, lead digital rights or something like that. You never know. But I do think Australia and New Zealand is really ripe for innovation. You know, we've got some really, really yeah, we've got like Atlassian and Canva is really big tech success stories doing great things. We've got other, um, cross industry innovation spinning up. And I mean, if anything, I'm really interested in, in champion it. So, but maybe Ben and I will do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll be happy to help. <laughs> yeah. Come and join the team, Susie. We, yeah. you know, we could do with someone of your caliber on the team, you know, <laughs> um, Ben, you want to say? Yeah. Susie, <laughs> you, you triggered something before when you said, uh, our, our children, and that's something that I'm passionate about is protecting the next generation and then therefore subsequent generations beyond, you know, mainly for my children, but for then hopefully grandchildren and whatever comes next. Um, with the narrative shift that you're pioneering at the moment, you know, we've got places like Apple who are creating capabilities that allow for opt-in, opt-out. Um, but 
organizations like Google, like Facebook have relied upon in the last few years, these surveillance-based marketing and, and all of the, um, all of these, how is that being, how is that, uh, I'll say it again, how, how is that being reflected in terms of the work you're doing and the work Apple are doing to provide those capabilities for organizations that rely on revenue based on surveillance-based marketing, et cetera? Well, in one way, I think looking at the children's rights perspective is really helping shift this dial, you know, for all of us. Um, and what we've seen, I think it was really the first statement at the UN level on the right to freedom of thought in the digital age, which came with the UN um, Committee on the Rights of the Child uh, general comment on children's rights uh, in the digital environment where it looked at, you know, well, actually, what does this all mean uh, for children's rights? Um, not just advertising, but also the kind of inferences that are being drawn out of children. We're seeing it now increasingly in discussions around, you know, Google educational tools and ed tech and how ed tech is being used to kind of extract information that we don't know where it's going and how it's going to be used. So I think children's rights is a really useful prism for focusing people's minds, because as you say, it's the kind of, it's the easiest point where people are, are, are concerned about, and you see organizations like five rights, um, based in the UK with, but with kind of global reach, looking at all of these issues from a children's rights perspective, but which then has a knock on, uh, effect on, uh, you know, on everything else. Having said that. In some directions, you can see that the child online safety discussions are sometimes, you know, polarized as well with, on the one hand, child safety, and on the other hand, privacy campaigners sort of uh, locking horns. And so you can, you can see in, in many areas, I think, of technology, how different human rights perspectives sort of knock up against each other. And you see it as well you know, in the online pornography discussions. So when Iceland suggested banning um, online pornography, and I mean, they have a general ban on pornography offline. So banning online pornography was really just an update of their laws, but they were immediately, uh, you know, um, hounded out of it, if you like, by freedom of expression campaigns globally, kind of saying this is a massive threat to freedom of expression. So children's rights are incredibly useful, I think, for focusing the issues, but there are some areas and, and we're seeing it now in, in the kind of, um, debates about monitoring private communications for child sexual abuse images and sort of, you know, how, how that, uh, pans out. There aren't easy answers necessarily, but again, I think this is a question of freedom of thought and freedom of opinion at the heart of how we think about these things can help to focus, you know, wh where the solutions are. But I think children's rights is at the cutting edge of where these debates are right now. And as I said earlier, I think once you decide that something is not good for children, often you then start thinking, well, why is it good for me? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. That's exactly right. You, you mentioned earlier about the brain print as well, and, and that got me thinking about, you know, my daughters and, and again, the, the children aspect of it. If we start, if we start down that path without putting uh, guide paths all around it or putting some principles alongside it that suggest it should be just for medical, how does that affect our children's ability for, or children's right to freedom of thought? Um, you know, I keep thinking about the children with, you know, as they grow older and uh, brain machine interfaces become the norm that they, you know, the younger they get implanted into children, which means that then these BMIs have categorically mapped their thought processes from such a young age, which means, you know, they potentially go for a job. They you know, go for whatever it is, relationships, people can see their thought process mapped out from such a young age and they can be predetermined of who they are what they believe in. So there's, there's already, they're already, you know, if it, if it continues down that path, they're already growing into a, a realm where the predetermined state becomes the norm. Absolutely. And, and one of the things that I find fascinating is this idea that, you know, we're so willing to just believe the technology, 
you know, even if something's proved to be junk, you know, if the computer says something, you know, it must be so in the same way as, you know, potentially, you know, looking in the stars or, or looking, you know, backwards when I looked at in the book, the kind of history of physiognomy, which we're also seeing re-emerging in AI, this idea that from a photograph of your face, you can tell with a high degree of accuracy, you know, what your sexual orientation is, you know, what your political opinions are. And that's, you know, that's without your brain, um, computer interface. That's just your photograph, which is for most of us everywhere allowing people to kind of make judgments about you, which will then dictate how they treat you, you know, yeah. Whether they want to date you, whether they, uh, want to let you into the country, whether they want to let you vote, whether they're going to give you a job. Um, and, you know, looking historically, you know, in the Victorian era, you know, physiognomy was a really big booming industry and in that you could send a photograph of your, you know, beloved or your daughter's beloved, if you like, off to a physiognomist who would tell you what a you know nasty piece of work they are and that they're never going to um, amount to anything and you should, you know, write them off immediately. Um, and, and, you know, now we kind of laugh at that, but actually tech is being designed to do just that right now. Uh, and so what we need is, you know, not that technology um, and we don't need to prove that it's true. We just need to say you can't do that. And, and the ed tech space, I think, is, is really complex and difficult. And again, we've sort of allowed things into our children's lives to, you know, promote their intellectual de uh, you know, development, to protect their safety. You know, we're, we're full, I don't know, in Australia, but I mean, in the UK, you know, I, I see it in, in my daughter's schools, you know, safety tech everywhere, which is monitoring everything that they engage with online and that they're or offline actually, and that they're obliged to use the school computer so that they can be kept safe. But actually we don't know how the information that's being gathered will be used now or in the future. We don't know how that's going to affect their ability to get into university, how it's going to affect their ability to get an interview for a job, how it's going to affect you know, how they're treated by the criminal justice system. We, we don't know. It's not properly controlled. And so that's, I think, where we see the double edge of the children's rights perspective is, you know, and the tech, the good perspective is, you know, this idea that, you know, we're going to do this to protect children. Well, that's great. But actually, are we protecting children? What does this mean about protecting uh, our children's futures? And so that, that child rights perspective can be used to push forward things that actually potentially might destroy our children's futures while being billed as protecting, protecting them in their present state. Susie, could you ever imagine a world where we do leverage technology for the good? Maybe some examples around, probably more so behavioural or, or language, but maybe those examples around trafficking or extremism and those sort of things, or is the onus on us to actually gather around and have these ethical conversations and look at the governance first? Like, what are your thoughts on all of that? I'm not persuaded by the tech for good in terms of sort of combating extremism. I mean, if you look at the, um, you know, the way that that has been developed and, you know, in some ways this idea that, you know, you can pick up on people at risk of uh, radicalization and then, you know, feed them stories or engagement that might, you know, turn them around. That is so clearly double-edged in the same way um, as subliminal advertising, that it's like really, you know, maybe we just need to step back and just not do this. Maybe we just need to not be manipulating people's um, thought processes. And even in terms of the monitoring of signs of radicalization, um, there is uh, research around um, that seems to show that actually having, you know, radicalized or extremist thoughts is not particularly connected to actually carrying out, for example, terrorist acts. Um, and so does it really matter then if, you know, if, if people are having thoughts that might be being picked up, do we need to engage with that? Or actually, do we need to engage with how people are behaving, um, it, you know, in a, in a day to day rather than trying to desperately you know, get behind, um, people's, people's skulls, if you like to, to twist it around, because 
if you're in the business of twisting people's minds, then you can twist them in whichever direction, according to who's got the most money to pay for it, if you like, or the most, you know, the most power. So in those areas, I, I don't think we should be pursuing, um, research and, and innovation. But there are other areas, um, which I think are important. So, you know, when you see, you talk about trafficking and so, you know, if you're looking at data, which is not about what's going on inside people's minds, but which is looking at, you know, big data to identify hotspots or trafficking routes or, or that sort of thing, then, then yes, there could well be really useful ways that technology can be used to protect human rights. And we're seeing, um, you know, the development of technology used by human rights activists, uh, to bring human rights, uh, violators to justice internationally, for example. Um, or we also see in the U S there's a, an organization called data for black lives, you know, which looks at publicly accessible data to identify, you know, discrimination and, you know, the negative trends to sort of promote social justice in the U S but those interventions are not looking at getting inside individuals' minds and changing them. They're about, you know, collecting the data that we have at a societal level and using that to address human rights challenges. So I do think there are really huge, um, areas of potential for technology to be used to promote human rights. But I think one of the problems that we see in the tech for good space is that people have a great idea, but then they're nervous about talking to human rights people to kind of get a sense of what's the worst that can happen. Um, because then they think they won't be allowed to do what, what they're planning, which may be the case. There are some things which maybe actually you're just going to have to shelve it, but that's also you know, that's what being an entrepreneur is. That's what innovation is. It's, you know, not every idea you have, um, is going to be viable. So I think considering, you know, the downsides is a really, really important part of looking at innovation and, or whether you go there at all, or just, you know, just say, okay, this is too potentially dangerous. Um, you know, too much of a, of a threat to human rights and, and our society. And we just have to go in a different direction. That's probably the best summary ever, Susie. That's going right at the start of this episode for sure. Cause that's really the crux of the argument for me. Like, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Can Susie, how do we protect innovation with that in mind? Uh, there's so much innovation happening. Is it a human rights hub that we give, you know, innovators and, and, uh, and people early access to, to, to help drive human rights as the, the foundational element of innovation, you know, in your thoughts, how do we protect innovation with that a front in mind? I think that is, you know, having, yeah, having a human rights hub where innovators can access it. I mean, a properly funded human rights hub is one of the problems you have, you know, on, on human rights is that people kind of assume that you should just be doing it for free. So, you know, and activists and human rights organizations and human rights experts are often doing an awful lot of, you know, pro bono work for, you know, vulnerable communities and, and, um, individuals. Um, but actually, you know, for innovation, if you want your innovation to be human rights compliant, to not destroy the world, then you need to be paying for human rights advice, you know, accessible human rights advice. And that I think goes as well to the funders, you know, right at the beginning, you know, investors should be getting on board human rights advisors to tell them, you know, actually this is, you know, these are the potential downsides. These are the dangers. These are the human rights implications. If they decide to go ahead, then that's fine. But, you know, you need to know what you're looking at and to understand what you're looking at, you don't need just a, a sort of an impact assessment. That's a tick box exercise. You don't need somebody coming in and writing a glowing report about your company five years down the line. What you need is before it even happens, somebody you know, giving the, you know, professional, potentially, um, you know, confidential advice to say, these are the things you want to be thinking about before you put your money here, before you put your efforts here, um, and, and how you can engage with that. And I think having conversations between human rights people and technologists is really, really important. And, you know, as I said earlier, I spent a lot of 
the early part of my career working on human rights and counterterrorism and human rights and security. And I mean, the most fascinating conversations I had were with people working on the front line, whether it's, you know, police, security services all over the world. Um, and actually having open dialogue with people who suddenly understood why human rights actually works for them um, and isn't just something that's being used to attack them or to criticize them. Um, and those conversations are incredibly powerful. And I believe, you know, change the way our societies work and the way, you know, our, our children's world uh, will be. And so for me, having those conversations with the people who are working on tech innovation, um, in a way where you can have the conversation early on and it's not a sort of attack, if you like, it's not a, I'm coming to, you know, rain on your parade. It's more like I'm coming to talk to you about what might happen if the parade turns into a riot or there's a deluge and what you can do to maybe, you know, mitigate that b before it happens so that everybody goes home happy. Um, you know, I, th I think those conversations are incredibly important and I hope that they will start to happen. But one of the big problems is about funding. Um, and, you know, you see the eye-watering amounts of money um, being invested in technology without actually that kind of serious assessment. And, and you'll see discussions around ethics. And I think that's another area where in some circumstances, ethics has always been set up against human rights. So, you know, ethics is where we can talk about, you know, nice ideas, but we don't have to do uh, what ethics says because it, it's not enforceable. Um, but, you know, human rights law is effectively ethics with teeth. You know, that's what it's founded in. It's founded in ethics and philosophy, uh, but with, you know, legally enforceable powers that actually make people have to sit up and listen. And it's also a kind of practical development. The way human rights law has developed, particularly in courts like the European Court of Human Rights, where it's, you know, looking at real concrete cases and saying, okay, well, how does this work in these very complex, difficult situations? You know, it does give us actually a really useful framework to think about the future uh, and to plan for the future. So I hope those conversations will increasingly happen, but they have to be funded. Yeah, we've worked out a really good way to autonomously distribute this pos this podcast cross platform. Susie, we'll work out a way to distribute this exact episode to all the funders in high tech. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah. It is surveillance <laughs> advertising. <laughs> Plot twist. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you know, it is one of those things that, you know, the irony is uh, that, you know, I very recently joined Instagram because I was told I should because I had a book out. Um, and, um, you know, so there I am suddenly having to deal with being on Instagram, but having resisted it for a very long time. Yeah. Turn, <laughs> off, the target last. Turn off the targeted advertising over there. I'm just <laughs> in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> opt out, opt out. Yeah. I'm actually going the full year. Instagram free, Instagram and Facebook free this year. That's my, I always have this astronomical goal for the calendar year. Yeah. And uh, it's going well halfway through. No Instagram or yeah. Facebook. I've been going pretty hard on LinkedIn though, Susie, as you know, take me on. Uh, my yeah. No, LinkedIn is my kind of you know, downfall. So LinkedIn and Twitter. <laughs> nice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Love it. I want to pivot over to something we spoke about at the start. Susie, just around your thoughts on human rights of armed forces, personnel and technology. Yeah, I think it's an incredibly interesting area that we'll see. And I mean, you know, you will be very well aware of, you know, the military sphere being a real space for tech innovation, particularly. And what we've heard a lot when we talk about, you know, um, the technological developments in warfare, we hear a lot about the impacts on the ground, if you like, sort of the victims of war. But one of the areas that hasn't been much discussed, but where there are starting to be discussions again on, you know, in fora like the OSCE, the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe, is looking at what does it actually mean for the human rights of armed forces personnel? What does it mean for the people who are using this um, technology? Um, and the, the right to freedom of thought and the kind of questions of agency and autonomy, I think, are really crucial in this space. Um, one of the areas of, of development is about sort of brain computer interfaces. And so how do armed forces personnel feel about what is the impact of them on them of being, you know, fused with a computer, if you like, how, how, how does that affect how they feel about what's happening, about the impact of what they're doing 
on the ground about their ability to control. And I think there's been some interesting research in Australia uh, about how armed forces personnel feel and, and are in a way sort of reluctant, if you like, to engage in warfare in a situation where they don't have ultimate control, where they feel that, you know, the computer is, is taking over, if you like, and that they're losing um, their humanity. There's also, you know, about augmentation, the use of technology to sort of augment cognitive ability and that sort of thing, which raises big questions again of consent. Uh, you know, what happens if we're trying to create superhumans in a, in a military space? You know, what happens to those that feel that they have to um, be subjected to this sort of enhancement? What happens to those that refuse? Um, and so they're quite kind of big and fundamental questions about, about what it means to be human right at this kind of, you know, right on the front line. I mean, literally um, on the front line. Yeah. Can attest to that, Susie. Uh, 10 years in the military, spent a lot of that time at the forefront of those new technologies and being deployed in, you know, uh, operational theaters across you know, the Middle East and, and even in counterterrorism uh, for the protection of the Australian New Zealand borders. Um, so I can attest to that. And, you know, you're talking about the counterterrorism piece earlier and my first introduction to human rights was uh, a briefing pack that we got from a human rights lawyer. Uh, and my initial reaction as a young, um, a young testosterone charged male in the military and special forces was I'll pay this off. You know, it's one of those things, but my mentor kicked me into gear pretty quickly and said, this is your legal prehabilitation in the hope that you never need to do legal rehabilitation. Yeah. Uh, and that changed my world because every time, every time we went into theater, every time we had new technology, the first question asked by the team was, has someone from human rights or the legal teams looked over this and what's our remit for, uh, how do we leverage this technology without needing legal repercussions as a result of leveraging this technology? Yeah. So that was my first interaction with human rights. Yeah. It was profound for me. Yeah, no, I think absolutely. Um, it is really crucial. And I mean, you know, in the military sphere, whether you're talking about it in sort of terms of humanitarian law or, or human rights law, you know, it, it's absolutely crucial to what you're doing and to, you know, how you view yourself, you know, um, but also this kind of question of how, how it impacts you. And, and there's also some interesting research, uh, that I saw relating to the U S and sort of post nine 11 world and how, you know, the, the shift towards more remote warfare meant that, um, there was a sort of lowering of deaths on the front line or, you know, in old combat. So that kind of went down and also improvements in medical interventions that meant that, you know, people could be cured much more effectively, but that also that meant that people were being redeployed. So instead of, you know, doing your, your time and then moving on, people were being redeployed just sort of on a, on a churn and that actually the rate of suicides in U S, um, military and former military had kind of gone through the roof since nine 11. So you're seeing, you know, people are being killed on the front line, but the mental health impacts and the, you know, ultimately human rights impacts on those people are massive in a way that maybe hadn't been thought through. Yeah, we're seeing a, a similar story in Australia at the moment, Susie. Unfortunately, we're losing a veteran a week at the moment to suicide okay. um, as a direct result of, of impacts from, from war. But it's, it's a true statement in that uh, with, with the remote capabilities of warfare, there is certainly a, a difference in, in the soldier, um, but we're seeing more of a critical thinking soldier. Um, and you mentioned the conscience, conscientious objector earlier. Um, yeah. There's a lot more power given to junior soldiers to be able to say no in, the, in their right as a belief or their freedoms of, of thought yeah. in how they want to act and, and enact uh, the, the kinetic action on the ground, whether that's in remote warfare or whether that's actually on the ground fighting uh, the front line. Yeah. That's interesting, but uh, from the U.S. side, I've got a few U.S. counterparts who they get deployed into a container at the back of a warehouse, um, but they're operating remote capabilities from that warehouse. So whilst their brain is fixated on the screen, they're in a theater of deployment, they're actually deploying technologies from the other side of the world. So therefore, you know, they're, they're talking about the impact of empathy in warfare is being completely removed because yeah. of the remote aspect of, of warfare. 
you know, the gamification of war, right? That, um, yep. that then becomes incredibly difficult to sort of engage in your daily life. And I think all of those things have really profound implications for our, for our freedom of thought, our ability, you know, that, that inner freedom, how we feel, how we think, uh, and how we sort of nurture that in order to be able to engage with each other. Uh, and, and if you like that private space, that inner sanctuary is what gives us our ability to then connect with each other. It's, it's, you know, we need that private space in order to have meaningful connections outside. And when that's being walked in that kind of way, you know, we, we are then losing our ability to, to engage as societies. Susie, all in all, are you still pretty optimistic about the future? I absolutely am actually. I mean, I, I, you know, and I hope that that comes through in my book, but it's also, you know, as I said at the beginning, I, you know, I wouldn't have spent 25 years being a human rights lawyer if I wasn't optimistic, I'd have given up and got a job in the city, um, and and got with the program. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I am absolutely optimistic and I'm seeing things changing and yeah, I'm, I'm really excited actually about the future. And for me, as we were talking about earlier, you know, for me, the most exciting thing would be able to engage with, with funders, investors, with technologists about, you know, what are their ideas for the technology of the future uh, and how I could help them think about that. I mean, I, I think that is the excitement. I don't know what the technological future is, but I'd love to be a part of, you know, designing what it is and, and talking to the people who have those incredible ideas. So, yeah, I'm absolutely optimistic. I love it. So good. Uh, I'm going to a little bit of a ploy there, but the old strengths finder, you know, you're talking to two fellow futurists, so we're absolutely on board with that as well, Susie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> um, Susie, something new we're introducing actually on this episode. We'd like to know if you actually have a question for our next guest. I suppose it's maybe it's a bit of a negative question, but you know, what areas of their work do they think might interfere with the right to freedom of thought? Great question. That's a it's great a great question. question. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. And lastly, Susie, we actually wrap up every episode with this. We ask every guest on, on all of our episodes to tell us their best dark mode story. Okay. Let me think. You got, you can take a while to think. Yeah. <laughs> is there anything Susie, uh, that, you know, you, you, you went into that was a really dark, you know, could have been a, a, a dark thing in your human rights or, or counterterrorism that you brought into the light or that you, you know, you, you're proud of your work that you did at the time in that, that specific instance, um, that, that resonates with you. And you'd always think back to, for instance, you know, bringing something from the dark into the light. I know I've, I've got a, a good dark mode story actually. Well, <clears throat> it's a good news story. I suppose among the things that I, you know, recommended in the book as moves that could be taken that would shift the direction of, of travel, of technology, um, you know, I included, um, opting in to recommend a algorithm. So choosing, uh, whether or not you want to have things recommended to you. And I think we've already seen, um, in the last year, recommender algorithms, you know, coming onto the table of discussions in Europe about AI, but also, as I mentioned earlier, um, suddenly finding Chinese regulation, uh, of recommender algorithms and talked about surveillance advertising and how five years ago, it was impossible to suggest that you would ban surveillance advertising. And now we're seeing it on the table, you know, political discussions, both in the U S and in the EU uh, and more widely. And I think then one of the other areas that I identified as needing to be shut down was the area of emotion recognition technology and the increasing use of technology to try and understand how people are thinking and feeling at a specific time and particularly its deployment in facial recognition technology. Um, and so my good news story for this year was something which I, you know, first came across on LinkedIn, um, but which is, you know, big news was Microsoft uh, ditching the use of emotion recognition technology in their facial recognition technology, uh, developments. And so it's not a, a one line story, but I think those three things show that three of the big shifts that I identified as needing to happen, uh, in the book 
are happening, whether they're coming from technologists, whether they're coming from regulators. Um, and so I suppose that's my best dark mode story is that it's happening. Things are changing. What a dark mode story that is. That's up there with an all time great Susie, surely. Yeah. <laughs> um, Amazing. Well, Susie, thank you so much for joining us on Dark Mode. This has been such an enjoyable episode. I will speak on both behalf of Ben and I. <laughs> and Elf, thank you. Ian, as well, in ANZ and across the globe. So I really appreciate your time and thank you for such an insightful discussion. That's been fantastic. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Susie. Thanks, Susie.